here is a Roundhouse platform. I am Noemi desplan lichtert and this is Brendan Shea. We are grateful to the Architectural Informatics Society uh, channel to be having us uh, hosting uh, Stephanie Lin. Really excited to uh, have you uh, here today to uh, speak about your practice. Brendan will be uh, reading your bio. Stephanie Lynn is the principal of Present Forms, based in New York, and co-founder of Design Collaborative Office of Three. Her practice combines artistic and architectural modes of thinking, ranging in scale from buildings and interiors to installations and objects. Prior to her position at the School of Architecture as Dean, Stephanie was an assistant professor adjunct at the Cooper Union, where she taught studios investigating relationships of form, type, and program, as well as representation courses in imaging and animation. She has also taught at UC Berkeley, Pratt Institute, and Columbia University GSAP. In tandem with teaching and individual practice, Stephanie has participated in numerous collaborations, including her ongoing work with Office of Three, which she founded with Sean and Ryan. In 2017, the three were finalists in MoMA's PS1 Young Architects program and completed the Governor Islands Welcome Center in New York that same year. Stephanie's work has been exhibited in New York, Los Angeles, Paris, as well as a, a number of other universities. And Stephanie received her BA in architecture from UC Berkeley and her MR AP from Harvard GSD. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. We're very excited to have you and thanks to the Architectural Informatics uh, Society as well. Yes, thank you both. Um, this is a, a nice format and I'm excited to present some new work. Um, I'm going to go for the, the, um, the typical or the conventional format. So I'll talk about my work for around 20 minutes and then we can um, have a, a follow up discussion um, similar to the format that you guys did when you when you presented. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll show a few projects today that speak to um, this theme of image behavior, which is a way of thinking about interactions between um, images, materials and environments, and um, both the physical and digital processes that um, mediate these relationships. Um, the, um, the projects that you'll see today speak, um, speak to a, a kind of visual fluency and, and developing that visual fluency, um, addressing the increasing importance of being able to dissect these processes, mediations, scenic structures, and spatial setups through which we produce architectural representations. They range from investigating surface conditions as embodying larger forces at work, to environmental phenomena that take place over time, to images as producing spaces in themselves. Each attempts to grapple with some form of simulation that in turn takes on um, a spatial consequence of its own. My work in practice more broadly explores relationships of materials, media, and forms as well, um, unpacking optical paradigms and manipulating them to reveal perceptual entanglements and present yet um, unexpected orders. This carries through to my academic work at the School of Architecture, um, where we all are right now. Um, and uh, the school was previously at Taliesin and Taliesin West and is now at Arcosanti. There's a strong focus on design build work, mock-ups, installations, and generally working at one-to-one, -one, often within our, our high desert landscape. So the projects you'll see will share an emphasis on a process that includes the gathering of materials that are physical in their source um, and have the capacity to inform a feedback onto digital media and vice versa, of course, and in turn project new realities. So I'll start with a, a recent set of works called Digital Frescoes. Um, the fresco, as we know, is a material and spatial merging of architecture and painting, building and image. Well-known frescoes such as this one, um, they, they highlight this form of painting's integration of substrate space and perspectival view. 
So at the material level in true fresco painting, uh, pigment and plaster fuse into a single entity. Contour lines can be present, but typically serve only as guides to be plastered and painted over, becoming unseen. Um, so this kind of mines the, the, the unseen processes of the surface. So this crafts a reinterpretation of these traditional elements through both material and digital procedures, arriving at an alternative expression of line, painting, and architectural surface in which the line doesn't disappear, but in instead transforms with its substrate in a mutual feedback. To create this work, a composition of parallel lines responding to a bounding shape are transferred onto a bed of wet, wet plaster. At contact, both layers alter and fuse in tandem, and the precise line work distorts, blurs, and at times dissolves into fills, revealing its hidden but potential qualities. So material behavior plays an active role in an open-ended process, embracing rather than editing out the uncertainties of blurring and deformation. Um, this is another attempt originating from that same drawing, of course, a slightly different outcome and um, a, a broken one <laughs> and the series which um, in which each of these panels takes on a different distribution of color according to that same algorithm that propagates this line work in response to a given shape. So in the process of the material absorption of pigment, the boundaries and surfaces transform, and um, in some cases they really transform. And this was an, was an instantiation of a project that has taken various formats and iterations for some years now. Um, it's called Accumulated Error, and um, one of the versions was recently at the Drawing Codes exhibit um, looking at a, a, a grayscale um, tonal exploration of a similar similar procedure, but this time um, printed on, on paper. So this project and the project that I'm about to show are examples of exploring color as a structural attribute rather than a purely compositional application. Um, this one is an investigation of iridescence as a changing color based on a changing direction of lighting or view and produced through image maps and illumination techniques. The project seeks to simulate iridescence, but not just for the sake of simulating it. It's more concerned with defining a set of rules and behaviors and using those as a material rather than a purely spectacular effect. Iridescence as we know it is often found in nature, um, in crystals and oil slicks and bubbles and bacteria, feathers. Um, and it's the effect of a nanostructural composition. So a perceived color doesn't come from pigment, but rather from the interference of light as it reflects off of a surface film. It's directional and, and therefore spatial, and um, we know how it works, but it's also challenging to represent because most rendering softwares can't replicate that nanostructural surface that we see here. And this sequence shows an imaging study by researchers at Stanford attempting to visualize the wings of morpho butterflies using code um, rather than modeling physical conditions. And I latched onto an approach that's somewhere in between. Um, and um, there were a series of studies that look at these relationships between directionality, surface texture, and light. Um, and a new digital material was created from a, a collection of photographs, translating them into different image maps to create a, a variable surface relief. And this customized relief um, combined with the changing orientation would produce a variation of color. So here's the image of the front and back side of the same surface without any applied color. This is a similar one to the earlier image um, with, with transparency in the mix. So this was applied to a series of interventions um, cited at the Art Omai Sculpture Park. Um, these are speculative interventions, of course, um, 
uh, for the purposes of wayfinding and creating a heightened perception of, of one's environment. They take on the form of deformed picture planes. So each of these colors on these surfaces represents a different curvature and a higher level of curvature, of course, displays a higher level of, um, of iridescence. And when combined, they create these more expressive aggregations. And I'll first show, show them in isolation and then in situ, um, where you can see um, their kind of introvert, <laughs> extrovert qualities uh, with, with curvature really being the vehicle for displaying iridescence. And I'll play a short animation as well. So they're quiet yet, um, yet prominent in the landscape. And all of these um, materials and scenic elements were gathered in situ. So it, it creates a, a, a specific ecology of um, materials and forms and readings that straddle this, um, this boundary between the software and the real environment. And in a similar vein, um, I taught a class this past spring that explored the dynamics of the landscape through representations of environmental phenomena. The goal of the class was to appreciate the, the slow processes and various timescales of geologic formation, vegetal patterns, and weather, all of course implicated in the rapid effects of climate change and animating them as a way of working with them and understanding them anew. So in the class, um, students mined the tools, techniques, and theories of a range of moving image media to develop ways of presenting the, the natural landscape as an active participant in a series of scenes rather than a distant setting. So this is, these are just some of the demos that were developed for the class, um, looking at uh, water erosion um, as it relates to UV mapping. Um, this is looking at particle systems um, of a dust storm using image maps to control both geometry and, and movement. And lastly, simulating atmospheric optics, in this case, the mirage. Um, and the mirage is an expression of different layers of, of um, temperature in the air. So this series shows a kind of environmental approach to rendering. Um, again, not trying to simulate reality, but uh, distill um, the components of environmental transformation and transpose them into visual structures and procedures that are produced through the, the animation software. Um, there's no post-production in any of these clips. Everything is embedded within, um, within the process. And um, this, this animation that you're seeing here is using the, the panoramic format as a way of transitioning from the scale of the landscape to the microscopic scale of its composition and zooming in on quartz as, as one of its components. It's a kind of riffing on, on the powers of 10. That was a student work. Um, great. And then um, a more recent development for the class, um, looking at lichen behavior as its own form of structural coloration. And of course, lichens are pretty fascinating because they grow according to a pattern that's particular to air quality, temperature, orientation, and surface composition. 
Um, and this is just a quick study in progress that looks at different types of lichen as they populate a surface. So, um, oops. So again, it's a it's a way of reading the environment um, through through color um, as a kind of indicator of, of surface condition and, and air quality, et cetera. And these wind forms, which were formed through the movement of air, speculate on one way of working with materials in response to current environmental pressures. Um, as wind speeds have been increasing over the past decade due to shifting climate cycles. These plaster casts were all produced using an applied air pressure meant to simulate wind and were formed much like a dunescape is caused by wind erosion. Um, some surfaces were formed using a variation of air pressure, um, which creates a range of surface conditions. Um, and this project is really looking at how to capture and communicate these dynamics of the atmosphere into a material and architectonic expression. Um, these are kind of proto-architectural configurations. Um, we also looked at 3D scanning them um, to, to work with them in more experiential ways and also look at them as, as, as landscapes in themselves. So again, this is combining image making and physical process in which material behavior is a, is a seed for further development um, in both the digital and physical environment. And uh, of course, some of the, the delightful texture maps that came out of this process. Uh, this proposal for uh, public furniture installation um, reflects on scenographic elements as well. Um, again, using a series of nested panoramic segments. Um, the furniture pieces are made out of eight by eight glass block, um, aggregating flat blocks and corner pieces in atypical ways. Um, and they take cues from Wright's textile block system using reinforcing bars to achieve these unexpected modular configurations and spans. The project learns from the historical panoramic building type, especially that one which nests one panorama within another um, into a kind of double feature. It's a, it was an early form of modern entertainment, of course, and was a way of seeing a complete landscape from a new perspective through the mobile and active act of observation. So this project seeks to um, simultaneously separate and blur those nested layers together across a singular view. Um, the doubling of the image and the object uh, becomes a way of showing multiple viewpoints of a single thing and asks the observer to read differences between 2D and 3D representations. So there's a play of the object and its representation within that same view, in this case, looking at the filtering of one through another. And um, you can see them separated out again, uh, where that relationship is more obvious and detached. So I'll just put this. There's supposed to be sound, but it's not crucial. So I'll end with a series of projects that came out of a workshop, exploring the structure of the image through the framework of the window. That's our beloved Tristan um, working on a prototype. Um, and it's a mini instance of a course that's evolved over the years to incorporate physical materials and settings 
um, now looking at one-to-one -one installations of window interventions that straddle the, the virtual and the real and are also extended through their own documentation. Um, I had the, the privilege of, of leading a guest workshop at Syracuse last, last month in which students designed a three-dimensional corner window that were then printed and installed at Slocum Hall, um, which is their, their architecture building. It was an experiment in immersive media that involved the integration of physical and contextual specificities. And um, students were first asked to define their aperture within the atrium through the application of blue tape in situ. They then created a site model by taking high-res um, quote unquote elevational photographs, um, stitching them together and then bringing them into Rhino um, and then of course, scaling them to the measurements that they were taking in real life. From here, each student embarked on a design exercise um, that balanced working with 2D and 3D materials towards multiple readings, um, unifying them through textual similarity, alignments between the actual and virtual compositions, and perceived spatial continuities. Um, so these are screenshots of their of their rhino models. Um, we had a couple of pinups um, and they eventually um, printed and installed their interventions in, in the atrium. Um, each window was built around a scenic structure that ranged from repeating an existing element to repeating a spatial operation to introducing new spaces altogether into their corner views. Um, they attempted to resist singular readings and instead asked participants to look closely at their construction as a process and reflection on the various layers of mediation present, um, as well as the seamless and ruptured moments of, um, of different materials. Students captured their installed work through in situ photography and video as, again, a critical extension of the work and yet a, another layer of processing. Um, so that is the end. Um, thank you so much. Hope I didn't go over time. Thank you so much, Stephanie. You didn't go over time. That that was wonderful. Okay. Do you want to get? Yeah, we, could, I think we could leave the, the okay. slide up. I'll leave it on. Yeah, yeah, those images are so beautiful. We just want to soak them in a little more. And so <laughs> also confusing. There's a lot to like wrap your head around. And yeah. I think that's also what makes them so successful. There's moments where you, I'm really scratching my head trying to fully comprehend everything that is going on. Yeah, you really have to look closely and we really twisted our brains to make this work. <laughs> um. But yeah, it, it was fun. It was a quick exercise. It was maybe six days total, a um, few hours every day and uh, took place over a couple of weekends. And, and the students, um, yeah, the students really got into it. It, it, it was a bit of training and um, there was a bit of skill building as well, which um, honestly created a slow start, but uh, I think it was, um, it was all, it all came out very rapidly at the end. Yeah, it's uh, so nice to see this project and the rest of the projects be focused on this kind of singular topic, the, the kind of theme of the image and all of the kind of complexities that can come out of investigating images as lines, as pixels, as animations, as printed things. Um, it's really nice to see the, the range of your practice that engages that theme, but also your teaching too. So cool to see, um, yeah, the, the kind of range and focus at the same time. I'm kind of curious, Stephanie, about the, you know, the title of the presentation is Image Behavior, and I'm wondering what particular attributes of images um, that are kind of drawing you in this direction. You know, I, as I looked at a lot of the work, I thought, 
that you're asking images to do things we might traditionally ask other mediums to do, like models or drawings, um, but you're filtering everything kind of through the lens of the image. And I'm just I'm wanting to hear more about how you position the image or if there are particular attributes of image that you're, that you're super interested in. Yeah, yeah, thanks Thanks for that question. Um, I, I guess a lot of the work, um, both the work that you see here and, and some of the work that you'll see on the website has always been kind of obsessed with um, looking at these paradigms of, of, of seeing. So investigating ways of seeing materials, of seeing the formats in which, um, in which we see and really mining that as a spatial structure. Um, not just as a as something that you start with flat, um, but something that's always implying something that that is a scenic or or a spatial setup. Um, um, I guess when I mean behavior, I'm thinking about specific um, reactions between images, materials, and spaces. Um, there's a lot of starting with uncertainty and not really knowing what you're going to get. Um, and I'm, I'm super comfortable with that. I'm, I, um, I like starting small and then just playing it up and letting, letting a procedure grow into something on its own. Um, so image behavior is a, a way of kind of identifying how you tease a process out and, and find its own properties and, and qualities and, um, and uh, I won't say behaviors, um, its own characteristics um, over time. And, and particularly how, how these behaviors play out in, in space, in three-dimensional space and against form and it, against physical, physical phenomena. Um, so that's the kind of ambition, and it has led to a very wide range of explorations, but I think that's the kind of thing that, that filters um, um, all, of, all of the work that you see here. I, I've been, um, I, I to maybe bounce off a little bit on, on this question of, um, about the title and the image behavior, and. I'm, I had picked up during your presentation, I'm glad you're also explaining it again through this kind of um, dimension of uncertainty, because I think that might be uh, something that both our practice and yours uh, share is the desire to really embrace uh, and be at peace with uncertainty and actually use it as a productive mean of, uh, of creation. We perhaps I should have mentioned it also at the beginning of, of um, this, uh, of your introduction is all of us are educators. So it was so wonderful to um, see both your uh, design practice and your pedagogy practice, right, as an educator. And I was thinking one of the, so in my career and training, and that was, your presentation was eye-opening about the limitation of my training as an architecture educator, is that often like color is the last thing we want to bring in and the one thing that we censor for the longest with students, especially, especially beginning students, because there's this idea that um, it will distract from forms and it will distract from uh, shapes and ooh, I'm running out of time. Anyways, if you could maybe speak a little bit about the, the outside of the, the project that you've presented, but in the whole holistic architectural training, the role of color and how you see it fit within an architectural training at large? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I um, and I was I was never formally trained in color, but I'm I'm super interested in the in the idea of um, of structural color. So a, a color that is is um, is present due to spatial conditions or environmental conditions in the lichen case. Um, formal conditions, uh, conditions of the surface, which you saw in the iridescence project. So um, color that's embedded and, and is part of the DNA of a surface um, rather than something that's, that's simply applied. Um, so this is very much um, not trying to be a super graphic, but something 
that emerges from from a process. Um, and yeah, as you can see, it plays out in very different ways, like it, it from from like simple interactions of lines and shapes um, to uh, more like environmental or natural phenomena like iridescence um, to to something more physical like the lichen growth um, as it reacts to different mineral conditions and, and orientations. Um, and I think these really contain clues into like I I, I really enjoy thinking about um, how we can start to read these like not just in as their compositions in their compositions themselves but uh, as a way of reading environmental quality for example um, that we can gain a fluency through through knowing color um, not just as color relationships on a color wheel but really as a as a reaction to larger urgencies that um, that define and and motivate our field today I have many other questions, but I think I have one that I can say shortly. Oh, I think we have no time for it. It was going to be about scale, and it seems like you're working on environmental scale and also representational scale, and that there's this kind of interesting uh, provocation for the one-to-one -one scale or the building scale that comes about because of that collapse. That might be a conversation for another time. This is our final closing minute, and I think we will use it to thank you again, Stephanie, for such an amazing presentation. and. So, and the uh, Architectural Informatics Society, thank you again for having us. Thank you so much. And I'll see you soon. <laughs> thank you, yes. Yeah.